Elizabeth's with the Children's Advocacy Center. Um, Children's Advocacy Center is a local and statewide organization um, that is a hub of support services for uh, children that are victims of abuse and their non-offending families. So if you don't know much about Children's Advocacy uh, Center, they do a lot of great work. And one thing they like to do is partner with organizations like us to uh, provide education on what child abuse looks like, how we can respond and report child abuse. And so we felt like this was very timely as we walk into the summer months of having a lot of families in our building. And Amanda is with our uh, shop, um, Elizabeth, and of course they have families and children in their building all the time as well. So we actually have a really wide cast net to uh, really take this information in, okay? And so, welcome Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, like she said, my name is Elizabeth Sieber. I am an education specialist, um, so I oversee all of our trainings and prevention efforts within the community. Uh, a little background about me, uh, I've been with the CAC for about two years now. Before that, I used to do investigations with DCFS, so actually going out into homes, responding to those allegations of child abuse. So um, I'm happy to be in this role and to be more on the prevention side. Um, so this is our mandated reporter training, but it's more of a condensed version because our original one is only two hours long and not everybody has enough, that much time in their day to dedicate. Um, so we're going to go through, um, like I said, a condensed version, so we won't hit every single topic super thoroughly, but that is why I gave out, I don't know if everybody has one, but if you don't, make sure to pick up one of these booklets because it has all of this information and more um, that you guys can use as a resource going forward if you forget, have questions, any of that. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about recognize, which is our, what are we need to look for? What are those signs? What are those symptoms? Um, so, we'll briefly talk about that. The biggest one I want to hit is respond. Um, we know a lot of kids don't disclose directly, right? They don't just come up to you and tell you this is what's happening to me. Um, and so, the biggest thing for us to do is to ask them questions, right? Talk to them. Um, they're going to be more willing to share with us if we ask if, versus if we don't say anything to them at all, right? So we're going to talk about what that process needs to look like. And then the biggest thing, too, is reporting. Um, I don't know if all of you are, but I know probably some of you are mandated reporters. So what does that look like for you? What are your rights? What are your responsibilities? Um, and just kind of how the hotline process works. If you guys have any questions as I'm going through, just raise your hand, shout it out. Um, we can just answer them as we go along. Um, so with recognize, we first want to give you a picture of what child abuse actually looks like in the U.S. as a whole. So these are national statistics that we pulled. Um, so we know that at least one in four children have experienced uh, some type of child abuse or neglect at some point in their life. Uh, that's a really big number to think about. One in four is, is huge. Um, so just in highlighting the importance of being aware of looking for those signs and symptoms in kiddos. Uh, we also know 95% of children know their abusers. Uh, what's one thing that you guys are probably all taught growing up when it comes to safety outside of the home? Stranger danger. Stranger danger, right? Yes. Um, and we still teach our kids that. And it's not a bad thing to teach kids because they shouldn't, you know, get into a random car or talk to strangers. Um, but when it comes to abuse, most of the time, 95% of kids that come to our center, their abuser is someone that they know, someone that they love, and someone that they trust, right? So really kind of wrapping our heads around that fact and understanding that that makes it the, so much harder for them to disclose because that person is a parent, it's a grandparent, it's a teacher, it's a coach, it's a neighbor, it's somebody that they have a really close relationship with. Um, and then finally, unfortunately, we know one in three girls and one in five boys will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Um, very, very real, very true. We see it every day at our center, unfortunately. Um, and so just highlighting the importance again of why we do what we do. So what does it look like here in Benton County? Uh, so in Benton County last year, we had 940 kids walk through our doors to receive services. And I'll kind of talk a little bit at the end of about a little bit more about what we do and what services we provide to families. Um, but we also received around 2,200 reports of child maltreatment last year, and those are hotline calls. So this is just for Benton County. And I think it's so important because this is where we work, this is where we live, this is where we have our, raise our families. Um, and it's just important for us to know what that looks like here, right? What we're surrounded by. Okay, 
So I'm not going to go into each one, but these are the different types of abuse that are recognized here in the state of Arkansas. So we have six total. Um, in the booklet, there are both physical and behavioral indicators for each type um, that would be like your red flag. Um, unfortunately, I can't go through all of them because it would just take me, it take me like an hour to go through each of them. Um, so with these, what, the biggest thing that I want you to know is that these indicators are not diagnostic, right? So meaning just because a child maybe has a suspicious bruise doesn't necessarily mean that they're being abused, right? Kids are clumsy, they run into things, they hurt themselves accidentally all the time. Um, this is just supposed to be a red flag that maybe I should ask some questions about that bruise to understand was it accidental, was it not accidental, right? Um, so when we're looking at these signs and symptoms, again, I don't want you just to automatically assume that that's what it means if they have something. It just should cause us to say, let me ask some questions about that. All right, so the biggest thing that I want to go over today is our RESPOND. And so RESPOND is an acronym that we created to help give professionals who work with kids tools to use when it comes to asking them questions. There's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. Um, it's a very touchy subject, so not a lot of people are super comfortable, but we hope that this makes it a little bit easier for you to start that process and to be um, have that conversation with that child. Um, so RAPPORT stands for, uh, RAPPORT. RESPOND stands for uh, RAPPORT, Explore Concerns, Safe, Place, Open-Ended Questions, Notifying, Do's and Don'ts. And so we'll go through each of them. Um, I want to ask you guys, though, what do you think are some reasons why kids don't disclose abuse to us? Fear. Fear? Fear of maybe the abuser, fear of what's going to happen. Um, yes, all of that. Guilt, I think. Awesome. Guilt, yes. Um, a lot of them feel like that it's their fault what happened to them, right? Or they might feel embarrassed or ashamed. I mean, and they, they love their abuser. Yes, that's the biggest thing, um, is that kids want the abuse to stop, but they love their abuser, right? They don't want that their parent to go to jail. Um, and then if they're old enough, they know kind of the natural consequences, and they're like, well, if I tell him, He's gonna to go to jail, and then how are we gonna? How is how are we gonna have money? He's the one that works. My mom stays home, right? Like, maybe think about all of those things, and so that's where our job comes in to really break down those barriers, make them feel safe, um, in order to tell. So we're gonna go through each one. Um, so rapport is the biggest one. Super important. Get to know them. If I were to come up to any of you and just start asking you about, you know, anything traumatic that's happened in your life you probably wouldn't be super open to sharing with me because you don't know me and I don't know you, right? So we really need to get to know our, the child before we start asking questions. Um, so when I would do this with investigations all the time, um, a lot of my kiddos I interviewed at school, and so I could see like their backpack and what clothes they're wearing, right? And I'd ask them like, oh, do you see the Paw Patrol backpack? Who's your favorite Paw Patrol parent? And they'll just, they'll talk and talk and talk about things that they love and that they enjoy doing, and that really creates that trust within them. Um, how many of you guys have a regular, or on a regular basis, have contact with kids? Okay, a few of us, okay. And so if you already have a relationship with a child, you might necessarily not need to spend a lot of time on this stuff, right? Because you already know them. But if it's someone that you don't know, you really want to get that rapport. Um, so super important, you don't want to skip that step. Our E is for explore concerns. Um, we want to make sure that what our concerns are, are factual and objective. Meaning that they're things that we either saw or we heard, right? We don't want to be like, I think maybe, like we want to be like, no, like I saw this bruise on them, right? Like I heard them say this. Um, so we really want to make sure that our concerns are factual and object objective and something that we have observed. So like a physical injury, um, changes in mood or behavior, um, inappropriate language, things like that would be something that's factual and objective. We don't want to make assumptions about what's happening. It's really easy to do that, especially to kind of make us feel a little bit better about the situation, right? Um, and so we always, we tend to make assumptions and we don't want to do that because we don't know the whole story. Um, even if the child does tell us something, that's not always the full story, right? They're just giving us little bits and pieces of it. So we really don't want to make assumptions. And then listen to your gut. We all have a gut instinct and it's right the majority of the time. You will see something, you will hear something, and your gut's going to tell you, 
that's off, that's wrong, something's going on, listen to that, follow up on that. It's super, super important. All right, our S is for safe. This is where we try to break down all those barriers of fear, embarrassment, guilt, shame, all of those feelings, because it's gonna be super key getting something as close to us. Most important thing, tell them that they're not in trouble with you. I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to kids and they think that they're the ones that are gonna to go to jail, they're the ones that are gonna get in trouble, right? Let them know that um, up front. You're not in trouble with me today. Uh, I'm just here to, to listen to you and anything we talk about, it's not your fault. That's another big one too, letting them know that it's not their fault. That's what they really feel. Um, and so the great thing about this is I do this throughout my conversation with them, right? So when I open up a conversation, if I don't know them, I introduce myself, um, explain about who I am, what I do, uh, get to know them. Then I go through safe, but I keep doing that, right, throughout the conversation. So a lot of times kids will disclose a little bit to me, and then I can tell that they start to kind of shut down. They block off again because they're like, this is, this is weird, this is different, right? And so you reassure them. You say, hey, just reminding you that you're not in any trouble, right? Anything you talk about is not your fault. Continue to do that throughout the conversation is really helpful. Um, make sure we get down on their level. You don't want to stand or, or hover over them. It's really intimidating. Uh, I train law enforcement officers, and I, this one guy, I just remember, he was practicing talking to a child, and you know, he was standing over the child like this, hands on the hips, looking down, and he came back to me and he said, I don't understand why. He's like, I did everything right. Like, why didn't they disclose to me? And I was like, well, think about it. If you're a child, you're probably waist high, right? What do police officers wear on their waist? Guns, badge, handcuffs, tasers, batons, like scary things, right? And I said, you have to really put yourself in that perspective. If I was looking at that stuff when I was a child and I'm afraid that I'm gonna get in trouble or that it's my fault, right? Police are already very intimidating people to a lot of us. And so from a child's perspective, that's really intimidating. So I tell people, just imagine that you have your own belt on, just get down on their level. It just makes them connect to you so much more and really makes them comfortable with you. We want to minimize our authority as well. Um, so a lot of times if I do trainings, you know, I tell people, if you wear a badge or something that um, really sets you up apart, we want to remove that um, because Authority is a big thing for a lot of kids. It's a big barrier if they maybe already have um, certain connotations of that. We want to get rid of that. And then just remember that you were there to listen. If you are doing the majority of the talking, the process is not being done right, right? Like they should be doing the majority of the talking. And that's really hard for kids because as adults, what do we tend to, when we have conversations with kids, what does that kind of look like or sound like as adults? Talking, yeah, we're talking to them, right? We're telling you what to do. We're directing you here. Like, we are the authority. And so it's really weird for them to switch. And it's really weird for us, too, to switch um, and have that different perspective. But that's really important to let them know that they are in charge of this conversation. RP is the place. So just be mindful of where you are when you're talking with a child or when you decide to ask, you know, start asking questions. Um, it's not really a great, the greatest idea to do it like in a hallway where people are walking, right? It's not really private or comfortable. It wouldn't make me feel comfortable. So just think about our place that we're going. Um, if there's a place that's associated with being in trouble, you know, like a principal's office, something like that, setting, we don't want to take them there because what are they already afraid of? Getting in trouble. And then we're taking them to a place that's like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, right? So we want to just avoid those um, settings. Um, and then minimize the number of people present when they're talking with children. Uh, why do you guys think that's important? Because more than people present when you get these are Potentially, yes. They're dealing with all the emotions that maybe they've had embarrassment. It's a private conversation. Right, yeah. Um, I just imagine if you had five people around you, right, all asking you questions about what's happened to you. It's very overwhelming and it can feel very, like I'm getting interrogated, right, like I'm getting attacked. So we really want to minimize that as much as possible. Now some organizations, I don't know if you guys do, have policies about like, you know, one child, you know, the 1v1, you know, you have to have another person with you if you're with a child. 
And that's okay if you do, we encourage those policies, obviously. Um, but if you do have to have more than one person, that other person is simply an observer, right? You are a fly on the wall, you're just here to watch, make sure everything's okay. We don't want you to interject because we don't want that child to feel like they're being interrogated or attacked in any way. So my question on place mm -hmm. is similar to Marie Four. Um, This child may have been groomed, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the very fact that I'm trying to be their buddy and friend is kind of what they experience, um, as well as you know, beyond the place. And, and I'm thinking, you know, a private conversation with a child is still in like an open area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I just see some triggers maybe happening with that child. It's possible, yes. Um, I think with as, with as far as grooming goes, you guys are the perfect role models for them of what a healthy adult relationship should be like, right? And so I think that um, it might necessarily, not necessarily be triggering because that child knows that there are good adults, right? Um, but there are also, unfortunately, adults who um, are not good. And so I think modeling that for them very early on is super important of what that needs to look like. Um, as far as place, I mean, I think the environment is fine as long as there's just not like, you know, people or other kids walking by where they can overhear because that'll just make them super uncomfortable and right. sharing. But an open environment, like maybe something like this where there's no one else in here, people aren't, you know, I think that's perfectly fine as well. Okay, our O is for open-ended questions. So how do I even bring this up, right? Like how, how do I start that conversation about their abuse with them? It's always really, really difficult. Um, so this should help you guys just in asking questions and how we do that. Um, the best thing to understand is that we only need essential <coughs> information, right? So we don't need the nitty-gritty details on what were they wearing and what were you wearing and what did you smell, right? Like that's, that's too much that can be triggering and traumatizing and we don't want to go into that space. Um, also understanding that if they come to our center with our forensic interviewers, they will get all of those details. Uh, we just don't want to uh, ask the child those questions multiple times because it, it's, it's traumatizing to have to keep telling and telling. Um, so just focus on essential information. So when we say our WH questions, who was involved, what happened, where it happened, and when it happened. That's it. Um, now. Where and when are probably gonna be a little bit more difficult, especially depending on the age of a child, right? If you ask a four or five year old, like, oh, when's your birthday? They're like, oh, it's tomorrow, or like, it was yesterday, and it's like, their birthday's not, for, like, they don't have a good concept of time, right? So um, really judging that on the age of a child, what information you're gonna be able to get. Who and what are the most important, though, for the hotline? We can figure out where and when later on down the road. Um, so we don't wanna push, or force a child, right? If they're not talking to us, if they're not opening up and you've tried and you've tried to reassure them, we should just let it go. We can still make a report to the hotline, um, but we shouldn't make them tell us if they don't want to. Um, it's okay not to have all the information. What's great about open-ended questions is it gives uh, the child a free narrative. It's very much their own words without us interjecting and making assumptions and putting things in there. Um, like I said earlier, we make assumptions about things. It's very common. Uh, there's one thing that I remember I studied in college called the confirmation bias, where if we think something is true, or we think that's where something started or came from, we tend to only search or seek out information that confirms that we're right. Right. So if we have an assumption that it was mom, we're, we tend to only ask questions and seek information from the child that confirms that it was mom. Right? And we just want to really stay away from that. And that's what open-ended questions allows us to do. Uh, we want to avoid terms like good touch and bad touch if we're talking about sexual abuse uh, for a couple reasons. Good and bad. Well, I'll ask you guys. Is a hug a good touch to you? It, it depends, right? Some of you maybe love hugs and love giving people hugs, and some of you are like, please don't touch me. Stay five feet away from me, right? Like two different people. So it can be different. Um, 
as well as it's a sensory questions for kids, and that, those are really difficult to understand, especially the younger ones. So we just want to say from away from good and bad. Um, also, I've had a lot of children, individuals use this language. Uh, when they found out that they had a bad touch, they then labeled themselves as being bad, mm -hmm. right? Because I received a bad touch, now I'm bad, or now I'm, you know, they have all those feelings. So we just want to stay away from that. Um, and we, we prefer to use terms such as, was that a safe touch or an unsafe touch, or was that a touch that you were okay with, or a touch that you were not okay with? Those are a little bit easier for them to understand and grasp, um, and it gets rid of any of those connotations that they might have around the word. And then finally, just avoid using any diagrams or dolls. So this means we don't want you to grab like a teddy bear or a Barbie doll and say, okay, so where, point to where on this doll that they touched you or hurt you at. Why do you think we don't want you to do that? Is it enough to play with the teddy bear again? <laughs> probably, possibly. It's yeah. probably pretty, a little traumatizing. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple reasons. One, if you know the child was touched, um, maybe they said on, <coughs> maybe said my PP, right? Do we really need to like confirm with them? Like, what is what is your right? That's a little yeah. too much information. We don't need to know that they said that. Again, we will do that later on down the road and make sure that the body parts are lined up. Um, but also, too, have you guys had any professional training used in order to do something like that? Have you guys gotten any training no. on how to introduce no. that? No, right? Um, and we have individuals who are trained to do so. Um, and if we have things like this happen, it unfortunately hurts our case so much because it goes to trial and then that defense attorney well, probably if you did it, call you up to the stand and ask you all your reasonings and you don't know how to answer that or how to respond to that. Um, and unfortunately, it hurts our case. We have individuals who are specifically trained to do that. We have a ton of, a, a mad, like we have a, a ton of, I don't even know the word I'm trying yeah. to say. Anatomically, Anatomically correct. correct. Dolls and diagrams that we use for kids. Um, and you know, a teddy bear doesn't have all of her body parts. A Barbie doll doesn't have all of her, but we, so we have those, um, those things to to question kids if we need to to confirm certain body parts and that's why i always say it's really important if any of us have kids to teach your kids the correct names for body parts because then it avoids any confusion on right when they they do disclose this on the board to happen so an example of what an open-ended question sounds like is you just call out your explored concern to the child so if it was a bruise you say lucy i see a bruise on your arm tell me about that um, Joey, I heard you talking about your parents fighting last night. Tell me more about that. So you're just taking what you saw, what you heard, calling it out to them, letting them know that, hey, I see this. And then you follow it up with, tell me more about that or tell me about that. Uh, that's the questions that we use at the CAC all the time when we're questioning kids because it allows them to, they have to talk, right? They can't really, it's really hard for them to not give us an answer to that. Uh, so the, the conversation would sound like this, you know, if I say, Lucy, I see you a bruise on your arm, tell me about that. Um, and she said, oh, my dad just got really mad last night. And I say, okay, Lucy, I heard you say that your dad got really mad last night. Tell me more about your dad getting mad, right? Just, that's all you do is you just take what they say, just repeat it to them. Also helps us remember, like making sure that we got, we heard them correctly. And then following it up with, tell me about that. Tell me more about that. Um, so those are the, that's the easiest framework, framework for um, getting, questioning children. Do we have any questions so far about open questions? Yes. So I have not worked here for a summer, so things could change, but it feels like we work hard not to have kids separated from their parents while they're in the facility. Mm -hmm. So there will be few times when we would ever sit down, have any interaction with a child apart from a parent. Mm -hmm. So maybe this where all the notify comes in, but right. I, I assume as a policy, we don't want to try to separate a child mm -hmm. from, from a parent to have these conversations, and from what you said, we don't want to have that in front of the parent, right? Hey, I see your bruise, all those right, things. Right, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so will, for most of us, will we go right to notify? <laughs> yeah, that's totally fine. Um, I, could, I would even say um, on certain, depending on what 
your concerns were. So for like physical abuse, um, one of the things that I always tell people to tell, to be able to tell if it's an accidental or not accidental is asking the parents, like, oh man, I see he's got a really bad bruise. Like what happened? Where did he get that, right? Like asking them, um, because their information, what they tell you can maybe be a giveaway of that's not normal. Um, for example, I had a, when I was working investigations, I had a six, a six week old baby. Um, unfortunately, she had really bad burn marks on her back. And when I went to the hospital to you know, see her and talk to mom, I asked mom, I was like, so tell me what happened. And mom said that she was sitting up and that she fell on the space heater that was behind her. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> right, exactly. I know, yeah, right? Um, and so that can be a really big dead giveaway for you that like, that's not normal, right? Um, so definitely asking parents is totally okay, I think. And you can just say, hey, you know, we just, we ask all of our, you know, parents about injuries on kiddos, just to make sure that, you know, you're getting the help that you need or if you do need it, right? Like you can, there's a way that you can maneuver that to not make it seem so attacky or judgy. Yes. And, then, and then maybe the parents just need a safe place too. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they're coming here. Exactly. Someone who has eyes to ask a question. Exactly. Um, and then sometimes, I don't know too, you probably have better relationships with, and reform those relationships with those parents, right? And they might disclose to you or tell you something as they get more comfortable, like, hey, this happened, or maybe maybe they're concerned themselves about something with their child if they're not involved. So, um, but yes, I wouldn't have these conversations in front of their parent with them because their parent could be the one that is maybe hurting them. Um, but yes, I would just move straight to <coughs> notify if we can't if we can't talk about it. Sorry, right, last question. Yeah. During these conversations, um, if you just so happen to have, like if the child doesn't see you have your phone, is that something you record for you guys to say, I have this recording for you? Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? I don't, like if that's gonna, like you say, interrupt your mm -hmm. case mm -hmm. or whatever, say I just have this evidence for you, do whatever you want. I wouldn't recommend doing that no. just because then they'll, your phone will become evidence and then you'll, like, they'll take oh. your phone away. Um, that's why we say too with like picture documentation, we don't recommend you taking pictures on your phone. Uh, if that's the case, I mean, if you have a conversation with them, just report that to the hotline. That's enough evidence. If there is physical injuries on a child, let the hotline know right away, like, hey, there's bruises, we need somebody out here to be able to document that. Um, but I wouldn't recommend doing it yeah. just for, yeah. Sorry, I over asked. No, you're fine. No. Just for clarification, uh -huh. our primary job is information gathering, not diving too deep. Yes, exactly. That's your job. That's our job, exactly. Yes. And I'll kind of, I was, there's a little bit other slides where I kind of will explain that, you know, between mandate reporters and investigators, I feel like mandate reporters tend to take on a lot more responsibility than they need to. Mm -hmm. um, Right, that's not their role, it's not their lane, it's not their job. Let those people that were trained to do it and have those difficult and tough conversations with people, you don't need to get up in that mess because it can get really messy. Um, it's so, that word mandated that yeah. launches us into this. Right, exactly. It makes people feel like I need to do. Yeah. Um, and so I'll kind of talk to you a little bit about mandated reporting and what that looks like. So I similar. Guess. Gather information. All, the, all these slides are, it, it seems like. They're geared more towards uh, the child has come to one of us. That that we've got a captive audience with the the, the child. Uh, you touched on if if we just observe with the parents. And I guess uh, that that would be more. I would love to hear more tips on is hey in a in a group setting. What are might be some things that that I would observe. Yeah, um, so those indicators will be in this booklet for the different types of abuse. A lot of, in a group setting, is gonna be more behavioral indicators, how they interact with mm -hmm. the other kids, how they interact with their parents, maybe language that they're using that's not appropriate. Um, so that will be a good um, tool for you to use yeah. when you're in the room, um, just interacting with them. Um, this is used for more so, if we see something, and we have a chance to talk to that child, this is how we do it. It feels like for us too, it would be a more, it would take more time, right? So we're building relationships mm -hmm. with families that come in our building. It wouldn't be something that we, unless our gut told us and we saw enough and we knew to report. Mm -hmm. That's not, you know, we would do that. But it feels like for us, we're building those relationships. Right. Every one of this building 
can build relationships with children and mm -hmm. families. And so I think that's a building time, right? The child does get to trust you mm -hmm. as an individual or as a center yes. and as a staff. Mm -hmm. And the family does too, and so it's more of a process for us. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, even the process of just a child disclosing, it takes time. Yeah. I have done this so, so, so many times, and I've done it so, so many times where they didn't say anything. So I think that's what's, that's such a good point, is that you are letting them know <laughs> that, like, hey, I'm here for you, I hear you, I see you, I will listen to you. You don't mean you might not be this time, it might not be the next time, it might be years from now, like whatever that looks like, right? Just establishing that for them is really important that you are, you are, you are paying attention, you are listening, you see them, you hear them, yeah. Okay, so for notifying, report immediately. Um, that's the, one of the really biggest things that we see a lot, unfortunately, is that community reporters don't report immediately. They, like, well, I don't know, let me go home and let me talk to my spouse about it. Let me, you know, let me talk, let me look, really sleep on it and think it through. Um, we don't want to do that. That's not, you don't have to be sure. You don't have to be 100% right that what's happening is happening. That's not your job, right? And that's another thing that I think many reporters take on that that, that is a part of their job, and it's not. Um, so making sure you report immediately. That's the Arkansas Child Abuse Hotline number. Um, or if you are a mandated reporter, there's an online portal, portal now, um, which is super helpful. I don't know, have any of you guys ever made a hotline call? Has anybody in here ever made one? Okay, a few of us. Um, if you've never made a hotline call before, you will know that you will be on hold for a little bit of time, right? It's not just like an immediate thing. You have to wait a little bit. So the portal's really nice because you can just go online, just type in, fill out all the information, and submit it. Super helpful. Um, we also recommend to dual report to local law enforcement. We'll talk a little bit later about what that process looks like and why we recommend it. Um, and obviously, if a child is in immediate danger, Call 911, right? If they can't go home, call somebody that can help and stop that um, from going back home. Um, so making sure that we have all of that. How quickly are the reports entered through the database? How quickly are they reviewed? Through the portal? It's um it's a little backlogged, so it does take about an hour or two before it will be yes. So if it's an acute Situation, emergency, call the hotline. If it's a situation where, you know, they, maybe they say the offender is not in the home, doesn't live with them, it happened years ago, you can use a portal. But if it's like in home offender, something serious is happening, definitely call the hotline. I would recommend that. So, for, for a couple reasons, I, I, I just want to be clear on this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, our you had mentioned our organization policy. Maybe that's separate from this, but uh, it, it's my understanding that we don't want all of our staff doing this. They're supposed to be right. Uh, funneled to the care. Yeah. So for anybody who's online or whatever right now, if for one, they may not want to do this. They don't feel comfortable. And two is uh, we've got to protect each other in the organization as well as well as that child. And, uh, How effective is it, though, for a care advocate to report something that they have nothing to do with? I'll talk a little bit about yeah. that um, in our next slide because that's something that I do get a lot, especially with schools and stuff. So I will. I'll come back and. So it's similar to the mandate thing, you know, we're all just looking at all this, getting great tips, and it's like, we, oh, I don't want to go run off and, you know. Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll get touch on. Um, some do's and don'ts, our last one, we want you to be brave. So I want you to believe the child, always believe the child, especially if they're telling you something. Um, you guys have the amazing position where you can tell kids that you believe them, right? Like I can't say that since I have to be, you know, non-biased. But that's so important for them to hear because you could be the first person that they've told or you could be the fifth person that they've told and maybe the other people didn't believe them, right? Letting them know that. We know that less than 5% of kids make up abuse allegations, less than 5%. So if they're telling something is happening, it's probably because it's happening. Um, it's really important that we validate them in that moment. Uh, remain calm, always, always listen, validate what they say, and then expose the offender. Uh, we also recommend just to thank the child if, for, if, for talking with you, whether or not they disclosed. 
um, let them know, hey, that, you know, I appreciate you talking with me. You know, you can always come back and chat if you ever feel like you need to, right? Letting them know that that's, that's okay and what they should be doing. And then some don'ts. You don't want to notify the alleged offender. That seems like common sense for a lot of us, but people do it. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Um, we also, I would not recommend notifying any non-offending family members, right? So like if they say it's dad, don't tell mom. Why would we not want that to happen? She probably knows. She could know. Or she might, you know, go to that person too. That's right? Or confront. Right. Yep, confront them and then maybe the, the alleged offender is like, well, I gotta leave town now. I can't stay here anymore, right? Um, or oftentimes too, what unfortunately parents have good intentions and they mean well, but when they find out something, they go to their kid and they start asking their kid, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, right? And as a child, I've noticed that the hardest person for them to disclose to is the parent, right? And so by us doing that, um, unfortunately that parent, not, you know, not bad intentions, but can really be damaging to that child. The other thing you mentioned earlier is all this, this isn't diagnosis. This is just information gathering, so mm -hmm. that other parent could actually be the offender. Right, and that's that's a really good point. Is that we don't, like I said before, our that child just be giving us a little piece of the puzzle, right? It's probably not the full story, uh, so we don't want to we don't want to tip anybody off. Um, we don't want to blame the victim. Obviously, victim blaming doesn't get us anywhere. It's not helpful, but we also don't want to blame the offender. So we don't want to say things to the child like, you know, oh, he's, he's, you know, such a terrible person and he's going to go to jail and, you know, all of these <coughs> terrible, terrible things. Why do we want to do that? We talked about it earlier. Because they love that person sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes that person is the only person they have to depend upon. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we start saying stuff like that, they recant. They take it back. They say, no, no, he, that, I, I lied. That didn't really happen, right? Because they don't want them to go to jail or they don't want them to get in trouble. So really important, we don't, we don't make fun. You're going to protect the like people that. you love. So even for the child, mm -hmm. if they've been abused by someone they love and trusted, which the trust may be broken down, but the love will still be there. Yes, that's it. It will. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to make promises. So we can't promise them, you know, I promise you they'll never hurt you again. I promise you you'll never have to see them again. All of those things, because unfortunately, our system is not perfect. Kids get returned home far too often. They see their other offenders again, um, and we can't control that, right? I wish we could, but we can't. Um, so you can make promises like, you know, hey, I promise I will always be here if you ever need to talk to me, right? Like I promise things that you can control, you can make those promises to them. Big one, don't conduct your own investigation, don't take pictures, don't feel like you need to interview everybody in the family or <laughs> anything like that. Again, not your role, not your job. Don't take on that stress because it does get really messy. Um, and then don't cry, get angry, or get upset. Um, children have a really hard time with seeing adults cry, emotional, right? I remember when I first saw my dad cry, it was so weird. I was like, this is not normal. It's, it's weird for them. Um, and so it's really important that we don't have those reactions. Um, one being, I had kids tell me, well, the last person I told, I made them super upset and I don't want to make you upset, so I'm not gonna, I don't want to talk to you about it, right? Valid feeling. Um, or they also feel that, um, you know, it was this terrible thing happened to me. Everybody I talk to just feels bad for me or, you know, pities me in that way. And that's a really, um, it's a hard mindset for kids. So just really important, don't cry, get angry, get upset. It's hard stuff, especially if they're disclosing to us in that moment to hear, but just try to remain as calm as possible. Um, and then when you're away from the child is when you can your emotions show. Okay, quickly moving into reporting. Um, so this is a mandated reporter law for the state of Arkansas. The whole law and everybody who is a mandated reporter is in this booklet. So you guys can look it over on your own time. I don't want to read it all for you. Highlighting just the, the few um, important notes if you're a mandated reporter, you have to immediately notify the child abuse hotline um, if you have reasonable cause to suspect. So to be convicted 
of a crime here in the U.S. You have to be you know, judged by a jury of your peers, and they have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt that that person did it, right? Um, for to be arrested, they have to have probable cause, right? So they have to be like 51% sure that they did it. Reasonable cause to suspect is the lowest burden of proof. It is just saying, as a reasonable person, is this suspicious to me? Does this give me pause? Is this odd? That's all that it's saying. So you don't have to have evidence, you don't have to have proof, don't feel like you need to do your own investigation, you don't have to do that. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so these are parts of the Child Maltreatment Act um, for the state of Arkansas. So this first one says that no employer or supervisor can prohibit you, require permission, or require notification from you before you make a hotline call. So if you're a mandated reporter, this is the law for that. Um, so if you have suspicions, you make that call. Don't feel, nobody can tell you you can't do it. Nobody can tell you, um, well, you need to come talk to me first. You're a mandated reporter, you have that right to make the call. Um, if you're a mandated reporter as well, telling somebody else does not meet your legal requirement. You have to be the one to make the hotline call. So if you were the one to see the suspicions, if you were the one to talk to the child about the suspicions and they disclose to you, you have to be that person um, because it does not meet the If they were to find out that somebody else did it and you did not, we'll talk a little bit later about the penalties that you could face for not reporting. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? I, I think it's important that if you're a media reporter, you have to be the one to make that, that call. And I think um, we need to, to help them understand what is a mandated report. Yeah, that's yes, good. and like I said, so in the booklet, I think it's like the first or second page, there is the list of individuals who are mandated reporters, but you guys can look it over and see who would qualify, who doesn't qualify for that. Um, I will give you a little update. There is some, some change happening to mandated reporter laws at the end of July. Um, I know that at the end of July, if you were above the age of 18 and you actually witness either physical abuse or sexual abuse or exploitation happening, you're considered a mandated reporter in that instance. Um, they should be, yes. So that will, that will be happening at the end of July, but I feel like it should have already happened a long time ago if you see something. But that's uh, besides the point. Um, so yeah, just make sure to look over that uh, list in that booklet and kind of help you guys define who's mandated who's not. Just because you're not mandated doesn't mean you can't call the hotline. You absolutely still can. Um, you just maybe aren't legally bound to or required to do so. What would you say that's coming? That law? Mm -hmm. End of July. Mm -hmm. So anyone of legal age who sees something. They are considered a mandated anyone. reporter, yes. And if they fail to report, so like if, you know, for some reason, like for instance, that happened pretty recently, a child had um, told us that somebody, her older sister, saw the abuse happening. She was getting sexually abused and didn't do anything it's to help. A, it's In a that crime. case now, a crime. Um, that person would be like charged. Mm -hmm. Like there's actual like consequences for their actions with that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that starts at the end of July. Wow. So, so how are organizations dealing with that who are used to say, no, we have a select few for metadata? Mandated report. Mom is now held accountable to have to report that. So I think that is kind of what we're trying Thank to Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. I had enough copy. So that's no, actually, <laughs> we've actually seen something. Yes. Not that we're The keyword is witness. Okay. Yes. Which uh, I don't you. think it probably happens here a lot where you would actually see it happening. Yeah. Um, so yes. But it, it might. I mean, you never know. Um, this part just talks about penalties for mandated reporters who fail to report. Um, so if they find out that you had suspicions, concerns, knew of something, did not report, and you're a mandated reporter, you can face um, potentially jail time, fines, and loss of any professional, professional licenses that you carry. Um, however, this also protects mandated reporters um, from being sued from the family, the child, any civil liabilities as long as you report in good faith. So as long as you're not, this mom's just on my nerves, 
you know, bugging me. I just, you know, as long as you're not, it's a real good faith. As long as you really have concerns, you're protected so that um, your name's never released. Um, you never get called into going to court. If it, this case does go to court, your name is always protected. So that's um, a good part of this act. Um, okay, so we're almost to the finish line. Um, this is just an infographic we like to use to highlight, uh, unfortunately, what happens when individuals who are mandated reporters do not report. Uh, are you guys familiar with Gerald Sandusky? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Do some of us remember kind of the scandal that happened that when he was at Penn State? Mm -hmm. We've got some answers here. I know. <laughs> he, so he, Daryl Sandusky um, worked at, uh, he was a football coach at Penn State University, head football coach. Um, great member of the community, had this really great program for at-risk youth um, with boys where he could have a football camp with them. Um, and it came out that he was sexually abusing many of those young boys in that football camp. Um, so the individuals in the red are individuals who have knowledge of the abuse, either witnessing it, seeing it, and doing nothing. The individuals in the, the orange are victims that we know of. Um, and then the individuals in the black and kind of like the white, the black was the ones who were like actually indicted. So like Gerald, Gerald Sandusky was actually indicted and charged. And the individuals in the white um, these like grayish white colors were the only people that were actually fired from Penn State. Um, there's one man, James Calhoun, he's right here. He witnessed um, Gerald Sandusky molesting a young boy in the showers. He's a custodian. He walked in because he was cleaning, saw it happening, and then walked out and didn't say anything. I just can't imagine being that child in that moment thinking like, this is it, right? Like this is when it's gonna stop, and then it doesn't stop. How heartbreaking that must be, that, that must have felt to them. Um, and there's so many people who saw victim number one and victim number two. Think about if they would have reported that, could we have prevented all the other victims, right? Um, so we just highlight this because it's so important to not protect an institution or an organization or a person over the safety of a child, right? Just because if it is a coworker, if it is a friend, that does not, that should not place priority over the safety of that child. We know that a sex offender on average will molest about 120 victims, most of whom do not report. Um, so the gymnastics coach, I heard someone bring that up, Larry Nasser, he has so far, or what was what the reported list of like 300 victims, right? Um, individuals who are child predators are really manipulative and are really great at grooming not only the child, but us too, right? And thinking that we are, they are great, these members of society. Um, so just really important that we're aware of that fact. Uh, we know two-thirds of victims will never disclose their abuse in childhood. Um, it's just the unfortunate reality. It's such a hard thing to talk about because we've made it such a taboo topic for so long, way too long. Um, and so unfortunately, many people won't ever disclose. Quickly going over your rights. These are some of the rights that you guys have as mandated reporters. I won't go into too much detail because it's in the booklet, but you can also go to this website too. Um, it kind of just gives you some tips, advice, if you're a mandated reporter and you need some help. Um, briefly going over the child abuse hotline, how it works. If you call the hotline, all of those calls are routed to the Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children's Headquarters in Little Rock. So that's who you're actually talking to, someone not even really local. Um, and then from there, you'll <laughs> disclose or share what your concerns are, share information about the child, how old they are. Um, it's, they ask for a lot of details, so they ask when's the child's birthday, the offender, when's the offender's birthday, like all that information. If you don't have it, that's fine. Just say, I don't know. We can figure all of that information out later. Um, from there, they will decide if it'll go to uh, DCFS or Arkansas <coughs> Crimes Against Children's Division. We are the only state in the U.S. that has two responding agencies to child maltreatment <coughs> allegations. Um, and the difference between the two, they're both civilian investigators. So I know, like the state police one, like you would think that they're like law enforcement, but they're not. They're regular people. 
Um, Arkansas State Police sees more of our severe crimes, so more of our sexual abuse, severe physical, human trafficking, things like that. And then DCFS gets more of our like neglect, um, some physical abuse situations on that, witness to domestic violence, things like that. Um, and then it'll be assigned a priority number. It's really important to know what the priority number is and what it means. So priority one means that that investigation takes 24 hours to initiate and lay eyes on the child. Priority two means that they have 72 hours to initiate and lay eyes on the child. 72 hours is a really long time. As an investigator, I can say, you don't just get like a call for like one case a day. It's not how it works. It's more like five, six, seven cases a day. And depending on the priority numbers, I might not be getting to that priority two until the very end of that 72 hours because there's so much other things I have to do first, right? So it's really important, like I said, if a child has physical injuries, letting the hotline worker know that. Because otherwise, if they don't know that, they're going to get them with priority two, and those injuries are probably going to be gone within 72 hours, right? Um, so just really making sure that we are communicating with them and we understand those priority numbers. Um, then I said to do report to local law enforcement. Um, the reason that we recommend this is that these individuals are civil crimes, like civil investigators, right? Law enforcement's criminal. Um, so they're two different entities, but they work together because there probably is criminal charges that could be filed against the offender. Um, so we recommend reporting to them just to get them a head start as well. Um, also, if you've made a hotline call, you can, you'll know that it doesn't always get accepted, unfortunately. Um, you might not have enough information. Uh, whatever the case is, it's not always accepted. That's why I love law enforcement, because they don't need an accepted hotline report to go out. They can go out and do a welfare check. They can lay eyes on the child. And I feel like it helps me know that, okay, at least they're being seen, right? Um, and sometimes I've had it happen where law enforcement will go out to the home to do the welfare check, and they go inside, and they see needles and paraphernalia and other things, and then a hotline report is made because of that. So I, I just recommend it. I think it's helpful just to make sure that somehow that child's being seen um, by somebody. And there's also, there's a lot more law enforcement officers than there is DCFS investigators and Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children Investigators. So, um, really important to, to do that. And you would just call local law enforcement, just the non, not 911, just the non-emergency <laughs> reporting number and just say, hey, I have some concerns or suspicions, I hotlined it, either they accepted it or they didn't, I want to report it to you though too. If you call and make a report, you mentioned like you didn't have date of birth or mm -hmm. some of that information, um, is it then your responsibility to call back if you do find that information? Nope. No. Um, from then, that's, it's now, we've passed the baton, right? Once we make that hotline call, it is now D DC places. If it's not accepted, the birthday and that stuff won't make a difference on what, yeah. Um, it'll still be documented. It's still in the system if it's not accepted. Um, so there's been many times where I've had cases where they've called in a child two or three times before and it wasn't accepted. Um, they, can, they can link them to information. So yeah, yeah, you don't need to call back. So it, it not accepted means it goes in the deep hole? Not accepted means it's not open for investigation. It'll still be documented on our end so that we can see, but nobody from those two divisions will respond. That's why I always say, call local law enforcement because if they can go out, go into the home, make sure the child's okay, and maybe they can find something that we can't because we can't, we're not always in people's homes, um, that they can report. So just kind of, kind of cover all of our bases. Is, is there a, any kind of guideline of what what makes it non-accepted so, so that we can maybe cover that? There is, but we don't have access to it. There's a, it's called the Child Maltreatment Law. Um, the reason being we don't have access is because unfortunately we have people use it for the wrong purposes. Okay. And we'd probably get a lot more false reports. Because they don't like somebody. Right. Um, I, can, I went on a lot, I've been on a lot of custody battle calls. Exactly. That's very, 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 very common. So that's why they don't make it public access. The only people that know that are the actual hotline workers. Well, we also don't want to try to evaluate whether it would be or not. We'll just yes. call. Yeah. Yep, right. Yeah. Exactly. And calling 
again, and even though it was not substantiated right. for the same child, is important too, right? Yes. Yeah, um, so like I said, I've seen people call, I've seen reports where it's like three times on a child, never got accepted, never got accepted. but somebody kept calling every time they had a concern or suspicion, they kept calling, and then it finally got in, and then I was able to see like, okay, so there's been some concerns for a while, there's been something going on, it's just helpful for the worker to know all that information. Mm -hmm. Where I struggle is people coming to me with situations that aren't ideal, like children living in cars, children homeless, and mm -hmm. they're like, well, we need to call someone about mm -hmm. that. And I've always been told that it might not be how you choose to raise your child, but as long as I'm not seeing signs of abuse or in a child still, you know, I just get really caught in the it's middle, hard. I feel like. Ne um, yeah, neglect is in those situations. one of the most difficult ones. It's the most reported because it's the easiest to spot in, right. in situations like that happen. Yeah. Um, the best way to describe that I think about it is as neglect, determining is it a situation of poverty right. or is it a situation of carelessness? Like I have the resources, I have the means, I'm able to take care of my child and am I choosing not to or is it I'm not, I don't have that, I need help, right? Um, so I think determining that's important. Uh, you guys do a lot of work to help with those situations. So, um, and DCF was, a DCFS would as well. I remember when I, I got a lot of neglect situations, it wasn't, I'm not gonna come in and take their child because they're living in a car, right? I'm gonna come in and say, okay, let me connect you some resources. Let me help you get to where you need to be so that you can keep, you know, your child and you have a house or whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, so I think you can always report it. It's not bad because um, there might be some other things going on that, again, we don't know about. So it could catch some of those things. Um, I think that is kind of a, a personal judgment call. Is your, is your gut telling you right. something's wrong, or what does that look like? Right. Yeah. So, Elizabeth, I, I, I can come back to the minutes for your reporting. It's okay. So, I just want to make sure, come July, mm -hmm. everyone, Every staff in our organization who's of legal 18-year-old age mm -hmm. is now a mandatory report. Yeah. If, if they, they, they observe. If they witness it. Yeah, we got to the event. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. exactly. Yes. If they witness it, they see it happening. And it's not for everything. It's only for physical abuse and then sexual abuse or sexual exploitation. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so it's only if they see those, either of those three types, actually witness it happening, are they considered a mandate or And work? then follow-up question, because mm -hmm. I can see the red flag, pro and con, either way. Uh, us, through policy, encouraging staff, uh, I'll seek a member of management when you see that event. Because then now... Seek a member of who? I'm sorry, I didn't hear Managed. So rather... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think that is a bad thing. Um, but couldn't that be used against the organization? Why? Oh, um, because the law says that you have to report it no matter what your right. policies are. I right. think talking, right. I, I, I don't, I think that's, there's not a problem with notifying after, right? Yeah. This, that yeah. law was talking about like before you make a hotline call, you don't have to do any of those things. So it right. seems like we would need to make it clear that you don't need to notify member of management. You're a mandatory reporter if you saw that. Although if I you want would, to I, I have nothing know. against saying that, you know, after you make the hotline call, notify somebody. Yeah, right. Right, depending on maybe the severity or whatever. Because there's a lot of organizations that especially schools, after teachers make a call, they have to fill out a form. Right? So like they have to keep documentation of that. And I think that's fine. The biggest thing is saying before you make the call, um, you don't have to do any of those things. But I think after making the call, you can make a, a note or a clause or whatever that you have to notify somebody or something, a form needs to be filled out, whatever that needs to look like, I think that's fine. As far as for your organization and yeah, protecting your organization, documentation, all that stuff. One page I have one more thing that's happened recently. Uh -huh. If someone comes to me saying that a parent said something about a child, mm -hmm. they heard it, themselves from their own ears, but mm -hmm. they come to me mm -hmm. and they want me to be 
the person that calls, and I encourage them to be the one that calls, and I will fall, because otherwise it's just hearsay. Yeah, it's not as strong. Right. It probably won't, it, it won't, if you were okay. to call and say, hey, someone, a friend of a friend told me this, right. it's okay. not probably I wanted to make sure I was yeah. in the right thinking in that, because I was like, I, okay. okay. But you can absolutely call and document that. Right. But, I told him that me just calling as hearsay is not going that they if anything was going to actually I felt like mm -hmm. go priority it was going to need to come from that person. Yes. Account. Okay. Um, other big thing too to remember as mandated reporters is that we are always mandated reporters, not just at work, no. but even outside of work too. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that we have family, friends, whatever we see something happen with our neighbors, it, we're always mandated reporters inside and outside. Of work. Um, this is a picture of that portal I was talking about. Uh, it's really easy to use, um, like, but like I said, I don't recommend it. If it isn't a cube case, I would recommend just calling. But this is great if it's not and you don't have time to sit on hold for 30, 45 minutes waiting to talk to somebody. This is much more time efficient. It's just there's a little bit of a backlog. Is that in this book? That website? It is not because it's okay. new. Okay. Um, so I would just I would take a picture of that. Um, that's not in this book. So it might be a good idea we make the call or on hold, go ahead and go to the website while we're waiting? Um, so you would either do one or the other. You would either make you would either make a hotline call with the phone number or you would make a report through the portal. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't you don't have to you don't have to do both. Right. Because it's the same agent responding agencies, they're just two different ways to do it. Um, like I know they used to do like fax forms. I don't know if anybody remember, but they used to be able to like fax a form in, which is also one of the changes that's coming in July is that we'll no longer do like fax forms. It'll either be the portal or the phone. Right, right. But if I'm on hold for an hour, I could have that done. Exactly. So that's that's. Um, I just say it's it's your judgment on whether or not whatever your concerns are, are they acute? Are they high? Or are they low? Okay, um, a little bit about us. So we are now the Children and Family Advocacy Center. So we were the CAC, we just went through a rebrand. So as of May 1st, we are the Children and Family Advocacy Center. Um, we have the same services, we just are expanding. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, so we see children and families who have allegations of child abuse and neglect. Uh, so they come to us, you can't just call us and say, hey, I need you to see this family. They have to be referred to us by like law enforcement or DCFS investigators. Um, so the child comes to our center. We have advocates to work with the families, uh, forensic interviewers who sit in a room and talk to the child to get their full disclosure, and that's where we get all the nitty-gritty details from them for the investigators to use. We provide medical exams, so a lot of our kiddos unfortunately need that. Maybe we can try to collect some evidence too that happened recently. Um, so we have medical uh, rooms in our center. We also have mental health services, um, and then we are now <coughs> providing on-site residential services. Uh, so we merged with, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Restoration Village, mm -hmm. but we are now merged. So we are one, so we are, um, our residential services is more like a program, not like an emergency shelter, like women's shelter, um, but it's a program that they have to meet certain requirements. But the great thing about our program is that there's no time constraint. So we really focus on making sure that that family is getting where they need to be, right? So we, I, we just had a mom graduate. She was there for two years because she got her nursing degree while she was with us, right? We really want to set them up for success. Um, so it's a program, there's certain things, but it's it's really great. So that's kind of how, who we are, how we tie in. Um, our main center is literally right down the road. If you've ever in Little Flock, you probably see it. Um, and then we have one in Gentry as a satellite center too. Okay. And then if you guys, um, I want to say thank you to you guys because y'all do so much for our community and we're so appreciative of what you do um, and we love to partner. Uh, I, we have a lot of families who would benefit from your resources so I'd love to get some information to be able to hand off to my advocates and case managers to share that. Um, but if you guys ever have any questions, that's my personal email, or right, my personal, that's my work email, please email me. I'm happy to if you ever have an incident where you're like, I don't know what to do, or I have a question, or whatever, please email me. 
Um, I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, and then there's our website too. If you ever want to come and just take a tour, we love having people tour our center to see what everything looks like. Um, and we love having people over. So thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for standing the gap with these kids. Oh, yeah. And you, you shared, I think, the average of six calls a day, 2,000 a year. I mean, and if only two thirds are not reporting, that means there are 12 calls every day that are not. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. one of the other things that stood out to me, I think, is I know there are many, many reasons that these things happen, but I think one of, one of the reasons it happens are for parents that get under so much stress that they can't deal with it. So, I just sat back there thinking of all the work you all are doing to proactively try to prevent some of that stress. Every time you're listening to someone, you're caring for them, you're helping feed them, you're showing them resources on where they can go to lessen their stress. Hopefully that lessens the odds of more kids being abused <coughs> because you're trying to handle, help parents handle things so they don't get to that breaking point. So thank you for all you're doing that, that hopefully decreases some of that too. So um, any last question or two before we go? Again, thank you. And Holly, thank you for lining us up. Oh. I actually had a question. Is there a line between, um, well, it's so weird to be outside of these headphones <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, is there a line between like verbal abuse and physical abuse? Like when, when does that start playing? I was, I was at a swimming hole the other day and there was mm -hmm a bunch of different families there, and one family started screaming at their child, both the mom and the dad, and like, telling her to get her ass in the car, and we're gonna, you know, it, it, it was ugly. And um, I watched them go, and I went and took a picture of their license plate, and called the cops, and told them about that. But is that is that the appropriate move there, when it's just phys verbal I think that's, that's yelling? perfectly fine. Um, so verbal abuse is what we call emotional abuse, and emotional abuse is very, very hard to prove. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you have to have proof that what that, that what that adult is saying to the child is detrimental to their psychological health, their development. Like, mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to prove because there's no physical indicators of that. Um, so I think that's a perfect option because there's probably more going on in that family. So I think getting law enforcement involved. They can see things, they can have access to things, and if necessarily or more could have been made from that. So I okay. think that's perfectly fine because there's really no emotional abuse. And emotional abuse can only be reported to the hotline by specific specific professionals as well. So a mental health professional, doctors, daycare workers, only specific people can report that to the hotline. So I don't think you can report it. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, that initial number that you showed, the um, calls for 2022, uh -huh. <clears throat> was that every individual call or is that per child? Every individual call. Every individual call. Like share a personal experience. Uh, I come back from overseas in 1980. My oldest son was two. Very active two-year-old. Rode a three-wheeler all the way up down the driveway, you know, bruises and everything. He swung and hit me across the knee one day and his arm swelled up like it broke. He mm. took him to the emergency room. I was immediately rushed into a room with a whole bunch of military police and interrogated for hours because they thought I was abusing mm -hmm. my son, which I wasn't. It was just, he was, you know, a very active, playful two-year-old. Yeah. But it can happen. No, it can't. This was it, in it, it can't happen. Mm -hmm. So give you an idea, it's changed drastically. Yeah, I think too it's helpful that we have technology. You know, we did the fractures or you know, fractures or breaks in the arm. We can tell if it is an accidental or if it's more like there's certain fractures that are gonna be from somebody actually twisting right. or doing something versus if oh. they fall off a bike or something like that. Mm -hmm. Actually but, it, was, yeah. it was just soft tissue, but it came back in about three months and it turned out to be a blood clot in his arm. Oh, which made everything tested was cancer. It was very dramatic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we thank Elizabeth one more time for her yeah. good